I think this is actually the first interview I've done since I left the company, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe longer. Um, well, as, as I said, um, Twitter was going to have a very, very hard time continuing to be a public company. It had many pressures upon it. Um, the advertising business we were entirely dependent upon and not just, uh, advertising, um, as you might think of it from Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, it was brand advertising. It was dependent upon huge brands or a collection or conglomerates of brands, uh, seeing us as something that they wanted to spend money on. Mm. Um, and because we were so small relative to our peers, if anything happened in the market or with them, they would instantly pull away from us. Uh, Snapchat was included in that bucket as well. Um, and they would retreat to the larger ones like Facebook and Google. Um, because we were a public company without any protections, uh, we had no dual class uh, voting set up. We were open to activists coming in. In fact, we had an activist coming into our stock. It's hugely distracting uh, and really, really challenging to build anything at all. And, and to actually build something that you have to take some risk upon um, because you have the pressure from these advertisers and, uh, and all this revenue suddenly going away. If you, if you make a decision they don't like, right. and at the same time, if that happens, then, you know, the, the stock has an issue and activist comes in and it's a death spiral. So the only path to me was to take the company private. And I, you know, Elon is, uh, our number one user. He's our number one customer. Um, he understood the platform deeply and he's a technologist and he builds technology. So at the very start, I was hoping for years that he would, um, and I asked him many times to join our board at least. Um, but when he decided to make a bid for the company or join the board and then make a bid for the company, uh, I was, um, it just, it felt great. Um, but as you all remember, that's the time when the market crashed, especially for advertising companies like ours. So if we sure. not get that, um, I, I think it would have been very, very challenging for Twitter to, to live uh, mm -hmm. right now. So uh, what happened, unfortunately, after that, after the, the bid made, the bid was made and, and, the, and the market went down is, you know, he wanted to back away. He did have a option to back away uh, at a billion dollars and just walk away. Um, but there was this fight about bots and, you know, the company took him to court when he, when he backed out and that's when things really went south. Um, fortunately, you know, he decided to make it, but I think it set up a, a, kind of, a, a dynamic where he had to be very hasty. He had to be, um, impatient. He had to move as quickly as possible with features, even if they weren't fully thought out hmm. and mm -hmm. it all looked fairly reckless, but I, I do have confidence that he'll figure it out. Um, I do have confidence, uh, in his new CEO. Um, and I own, you know, 3% of this, of this new company. So I'm, I'm supportive. I have questions about, you know, certain things, and I have questions about the long-term aspects of free speech on a corporate owned platform, no matter who the owner is. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but those are solvable. We were more, you know, ideally going for a global appreciation of free speech mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and free expression itself. And Elon um, took on a principle of anything that's um, allowed by law on the platform, which sets up a dynamic where you have countries like India and Turkey uh, who made many requests to us back in the day um, to take down particular journalist accounts or, uh, give contact information, um, and to remove them from the platform. So I think it's easier to do in the U S but at the same time, you are dependent right now upon a advertising model and the advertisers can do things like boycott, uh, mm -hmm. until policies are changed or, or actions are, are taken. And we saw that many, many, like, well, almost every year I was at the company, we saw that. Mm -hmm. Um, so. My, my one goal before I left the company was to shift away from this dependency on brand advertising and move to um, different lines of revenue. And Elon has started with that. And I think that will help the cause of, of being a platform for truly free speech. 
But that said, he can always be compelled. He has one person, he's one single point of failure. And pressure can be put upon him by the United States, by the Department of Defense, by China, by Turkey, um, by India, of course, uh, and it will. And um, this is this is going to be the the, the reality for any uh, centrally controlled um, uh, company or right. or even a protocol that's that's centrally controlled. So the only way to truly have free speech, to truly be censorship resistant, is to work on open protocols. And there are only two at scale that I'm aware of, which is Bitcoin for money and Noster for um, for social media and and beyond. But they're so niche right now, and they're so small. And to me, it, it just it just says at the moment that people don't actually care as much about the censorship resistance. Otherwise, they would be using these technologies more. And maybe there's not much of a need just yet. Or and and certainly the accessibility and the approachability of these systems is rather arcane for all people in the world. But that will that will change. So. I think we'll see how important censorship resistance truly is to people, um, you know, when some of these issues come up in the future. And it's no fault of Elon, no fault of anyone uh, at at the top of one of these companies. It's just impossible to avoid not having to take actions when there's a particular uh, entity, be it a government or your customers, um, uh, requesting that you do something or they leave. Right. Jack, one of the things that a lot of people focused on are the Twitter files. Do you think that that accurately reflected decision making, so what that's was taking place, you know, at the company around so many of these sensitive topics? And what's your reflection on that, you know, since their release? Uh, I, I wish that the the full corpus of the emails and all the information was released, um, so that more journalists and everyone in the world could see everything. Because I think there is some context missing when you mm. when you. Parts. And it's no fault of the reporters necessarily. They had a, a tool and they had to ask questions of the tool. And that tool would give them back fragments of information. Um, and that might lead them to get the other fragment to provide more context. But if if everything was available, um, I, I think we'd have a better picture. Mm. I I think the company, you know, my my leadership style in the company was just to trust our, our folks and, and that they were doing the right things. There's a lot of stuff in the Twitter files that, you know, I never saw um, because it, it wasn't at that level. Mm. Um, and I was surprised by the level of engagement with um, government agencies. I was surprised by the request. But if you look at that, our, our people, um, our, our team members, like they, they push back on a lot of that stuff. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it was, was questionable. So I think it shows a company that is struggling, you know, it, it, it remains the most important um, public square in the world right now. Um, and it was so challenging <laughs> to work in that environment. We were, under, we were under a microscope from day one of the company. And um, it creates stresses that uh, are just unbelievable. Um, but I, I think I think they acted with fairness. I, I think they generally did the right thing. Of course, we made a bunch of mistakes, especially around uh, the New York Post and, and the Hunter Biden laptop story. But I, I believe they're good people and that they were doing the best they could with the information that they had. And mm -hmm. um, I wish, in retrospect, I was a little bit more hands on in that mm -hmm. area. My yeah. focus was on, like when when I came into the company, we were losing users, and I would my focus was just to grow the company again, um, grow the usage base, grow the revenue. And we did, we, we actually became a profitable company. We, uh, got onto the S and P 500. Um, we had, you know, $5 billion a year, uh, in advertising revenue, and we were shifting away from advertising at the same time and growing. So I, I didn't focus on that area as much as I probably should have in retrospect and ask more questions. Um, it was all reactive when I did. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's a it's a tough situation. But I, I think I think the company did well. Um, but certainly, uh, we could have done better. And I do believe that we we were more fair and more introspective than our peers.